What is the role of experiences of violence in the history of human rights? How can experiences of violence be transformed into value commitments and more specifically into a commitment to the values of moral universalism? My first step will be a very brief examination of important documents from the history of human rights asking whether we can detect in them traces of the history of violence. So four steps, this is the first one. Second step, I will turn around and ask the question as to which parts of the history of violence have indeed entered the discourse on human rights so far. If the result of this second step is partly negative, that is, if it can be shown that the current human rights discourse is highly selective, then it becomes obvious that we need conceptual means for the analysis of what has not become part of the official discourse for insufficiently articulated experiences. The research on trauma, and this is my third step, has recently become prominent in the humanities and the social sciences as a means for exactly that purpose. I share the belief that we have an important approach here, although I am deeply skeptical with regard to some work that has been done on that basis. Fourthly and lastly, I will try to systematize the conditions for the successful transformation of experiences of violence into universalist value commitments. This will also lead me to a concluding reflection on why such historico-sociological research is indeed relevant for moral philosophy. First, if you take important codifications of human rights as your point of departure, it's not difficult to demonstrate, at least for this time after the Second World War, the importance of the history of violence for them. Now, in the German version of this manuscript, I go through the early German post-war constitutions on the level of the German Länder, the, the individual states, in the German case, then also on the level of the federal constitution, the concept of human dignity was placed at the beginning of the constitution and formed a crucial point of orientation already in the plans of the most important group of the anti-Hitler resistance, the so-called Kreisau Circle, before 1945, and then permeated the preparations for new constitutions in these individual states. They mostly refer to barbarism and annihilation and derive from the experience of barbarism, the justification for the basic value orientation of the constitutions. But the same, and that is of more interest for you, is true on the global level. Several authors in the last 10 years have meticulously studied how a shared repudiation of Nazism and fascism influenced the drafts preceding the UN Declaration of Human Rights in 1948. A Dutch historian, Johannes Morsink, has called the experience of Nazism and of the war the epistemic foundation of this declaration. And that's an expression I like because it's kind of paradoxical. I mean, what he calls the epistemic foundation is, of course, a foundation, but not in the usual conventional sense of epistemology in philosophy. Uh, he means the common ground of various religious and non-religious worldviews. Let me illustrate in, with a few details how the horror of the Nazi crimes is implicitly present in some of the articles of the Declaration. The emphasis on the unity of mankind in Article 1 is consciously directed against the destruction of universalism by means of race theories. Similarly, the right to life in Article 3 comes from the revulsion against the Nazi euthanasia of handicapped people. Article 4 mentions not only slavery, but also servitude. And the reason for that was that the forced labor of members from the population of defeated states during the Second World War. Article 5 does not only prohibit torture, but also, I quote, cruel, inhuman, or degrading treatment or punishment in general, again, partly because of the medical experiments of Nazi doctors. Article 14, everybody has the right to seek and to enjoy in other countries asylum from persecution, derives from the mass expatriations of the Third Reich. 
although its exact wording was attenuated because the original formulation, the right to seek and be granted asylum, was not accepted by Arab states. They considered the obligation to grant asylum to half a million of Palestinian refugees after the foundation of the State of Israel a support for Israeli policy. What a tragic connection with Nazism. Article 21, declaring a right to political participation, was consciously directed against the fascist doctrine of the incarnation of a substantive political will in an uncontrolled political leader. Again, the article was attenuated because Great Britain did not accept a reference to secret ballot with regard to its colonies. And Article 30 offered the seeds for an internationalist interpretation of human rights in the sense of a collective responsibility of all states to ensure a political order everywhere that would be in conformity with human rights. A late response to the fact that prior to the war, the struggle against Nazism had certainly not been considered such a pressing task for the international community. Okay, so I think the point is clear. This was a very abbreviated version of this first point. Second point. The picture, therefore, seems to be clear. I should add immediately, however, that my emphasis on the role of the experiences of Nazism war, and a little bit later, the Holocaust, does not mean that I defend what has been called one of the myths of human rights historiography, namely the assertion that the fact that we have the Universal Declaration can completely be explained out of this response to Nazism. This was, would underestimate the fact that the plans to promote an international Bill of Rights were well developed long before the scale of the Nazi horror was fully known. It would underestimate the role of other human rights violations and the reasons why there was a window of opportunity for such a declaration in the first place. I will have more to say on these other conditions for the emergence of the Human Rights Declaration of 1948 in my third lecture. Here I would draw your attention to something different. A problem arises if we turn around and ask which parts of the history of violence have indeed been taken up in the Declaration of Human Rights. Although it is true that positive values can be distilled from negative experiences, it would be absurd to assume that injustice always leads to higher forms of justice violence somehow necessarily leads to progress. I quote Max Weber, according to the inescapable pragmatism of all action, Max Weber wrote, force and the threat of force unavoidably breed more force. So it's a very, it's the opposite of the assumption that the experience of violence might lead to more intense commitments to universalist values. Suffering alone does not produce values. There has to be a transformative power in order to prevent suffering from leading to desperation and hopelessness or to a cyclical escalation of violence. 